Good morning, and welcome back to the Chapel of St. James Episcopal Church here in Danbury, Connecticut, for our service of daily morning prayer for May the 16th, 2021, the seventh Sunday of the Easter season. And a note this morning that our vestry here at St. James is going to be gathering for our usual monthly meeting on Tuesday of this week. So I invite your prayers, especially for that group of our leaders, as we're all digesting the most recent news, the guidance from our health authorities about our options for regathering in person, and as we are planning for the weeks ahead for worship and activities here at St. James. We are still planning on holding the two services as announced next Sunday for the Feast of Pentecost. The first will be our customary online offering at 9 a.m., this time featuring many of the languages spoken by people here at St. James Church. And then we will hold an in-person service of evening prayer at 4 p.m. out on the lawn of the church that will feature members of our handbell choir. And then. I'm going to be taking some time off for vacation from St. James Church. So our worship leaders are going to be providing these 9 a.m. worship services for you online the following three Sundays after Pentecost. I do encourage you to watch your parish announcements very closely as our plans for the latter part of June are going to be shared as those dates draw nearer because it is our earnest hope our desire for live streaming video from the nave of the church instead of this chapel to begin shortly after I arrive back from vacation. But for today, and for our parish leaders who are now charting a course forward through these rapidly, rapidly changing times, let us pray. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Alleluia. The Lord is risen indeed. Come, let us adore him. Alleluia. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Alleluia. Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death that he died he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Alleluia. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. 
For since by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. Alleluia. Alleluia. The Lord is risen indeed. Come, let us adore him. Alleluia. We continue with Psalm 1. Happy are they who have not walked in the counsel of the wicked, nor lingered in the way of sinners, nor sat in the seats of the scornful. Their delight is in the law of the Lord, and they meditate on his law day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, bearing fruit in due season, with leaves that do not wither. Everything they do shall prosper. It is not so with the wicked. They are like chaff which the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked shall not stand upright when judgment comes, nor the sinner in the counsel of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked is doomed. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers. Together, the crowd numbered about 120 persons and said, Friends, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit through David foretold concerning Judas, who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. So one of the men who had accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us to his resurrection. So they proposed two. Joseph, called Barsabas, who was also known as Justice, and Matthias, then they prayed and said, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go on his own place. And they cast lots among them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Be to God. We continue together with Canticle 20. Glory to God. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. A reading from John. If we receive human testimony, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has testified to his Son. Those who believe in the Son of God have te the testimony in their hearts. Those who do not believe in God have made him a liar by not believing in the testimony that God has given concerning his son. And this is the testimony. 
God gave us eternal life, and the life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue with Canticle 21, You Are God. You are God, we praise you. You are the Lord, we acclaim you. You are the Eternal Father, all creation worships you. To you, all angels, all the powers of heaven, cherubim and seraphim, sing in endless praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. The glorious company of apostles praise you. The noble fellowship of prophets praise you. The white-robed army of martyrs praise you. Throughout the world, the Holy Church acclaims you. Father of majesty unbounded, you are true and only Son, worthy of all worship and the Holy Spirit, Advocate and Guide. You, Christ, are the King of glory, the eternal Son of the Father. When you became man to set us free, you did not shun the virgin's womb. You overcame the sting of death and opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. You are seated at God's right hand in glory. We believe that you will come and be our judge. Come then, Lord, and help your people, bought with the price of your own blood, and bring us with your saints to glory everlasting. A reading from the Gospel according to John. Jesus prayed for his disciples, I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you, for the words that you gave to me I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. I guarded them and not one of them was lost except the one destined to be lost, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself so that they also may be sanctified 
in truth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. This past Thursday, we celebrated the Feast of the Ascension on the calendar of the Church. And so today, on this, the Sunday following the Ascension, today we're catching up with the Apostles of Jesus who are here deciding, well, what do we do now? Where do we begin? What's first? During his ministry, Jesus had, had previously hand-chosen for himself 12 trusted confidants, but now, now as we've just heard in our reading from the Acts of the Apostles today, now they are down to just 11. Just 11. Because Judas Iscariot had betrayed them all. Then he fell headlong to his death in a pool of blood in the field that he bought with the silver fruits of his wickedness. Yes, in case you were wondering, those details were there in the gruesome three verses that were conveniently skipped over in our appointed reading from the Acts of the Apostles today. Now, the remaining apostles, they are left one shy of that symbolically perfect Jewish number of 12. And so the first order of business that they take up in chapter one of their story is to choose a replacement for Judas. And though selecting Matthias by lots might sound kind of disconcertingly arbitrary to our modern contemporary ears, remember that the 11 apostles were first actually quite careful in inviting their newest member into the leadership circle. They knew they wanted someone who was just as experienced as all as the rest of them. Someone who had been along with them right from the very beginning, one who was there from Jesus' baptism all the way through to his ascension. They knew they wanted someone they could trust because they all had seen how important that fidelity and integrity and honesty and all those other facets of that gem that we call truth, how important that would be for their community. We Christians, we have been moving through that same sort of process of transition and replacement and growth for centuries now, right up to this very day even in this community of ours here at St. James. At our vestry meeting this Tuesday, we're going to be saying goodbye to a dearly beloved and longtime member of St. James Church who will now be leaving her vestry position to move away to Texas. And you may have also heard that the Bishop Diocesan of the Episcopal Church in Connecticut has recently announced his intention to retire in the upcoming year. Yes, it is true. Such transitions as these that are now before us, they can be difficult to endure, especially for those of us who are feeling left behind, left to continue on as leaders in our congregations and our diocese without them. Yes, we remember always that such transitions are difficult, but they are nothing new to us. We have been navigating our way forward through such changes for ages now. And when we have fared those transitions well, I think it's largely because it's been thanks to an honest and a clear and a straightforward and faithful and organized process that we've had in place, a process to choose a successor who is appropriately experienced and knowledgeable and responsible, just like those first apostles did in selecting Matthias. 
And when it's gone poorly for us, why that has frequently been because the transition was somehow rushed or muddled or chaotic or disorderly or unduly influenced by forces other than truth and integrity. Positive and faithful and godly transitioning, that is a process that is front and center in our field of vision as a church these days in so many different ways. And yes, while sometimes the changing occurs from a position of goodness and strength and health, sometimes it emerges in the wake of deceit and disaster. And so I'm grateful today that the, we have this reminder from the Acts of the Apostles. This reminder of how that very first transition in leadership among the Twelve occurred not because of some sort of graceful and dignified retirement from service, no, but through a despicable act of betrayal. Our first leaders did not have the luxury of generations of peaceful transitions to look back on and decide best how to proceed with replacing Judas. No, they had to act now. And they had to get it right on the first try. And so we see how they were careful and reflective and fair. But all the also how they were clear and decisive, even under pressure. Once the selection was made, the topic was not reopened again for negotiation at the next leadership meeting. No, they made their choice in hope and faith and truth, and then they stood by their call. And they all moved on together. And from what we know, from what we can tell, they chose well. Because all 12 of those post-ascension apostles, they all 12 stuck with their mission to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ near and far for the rest of their earthly lives. No one gave up. It turned out for the best. Yet, we have never ever forgotten how it all started. Our Gospels, especially the Gospel according to John, our Gospels won't let us forget how wrong things can go when trust in our leaders is misplaced. We remember with each leadership decision that we make how our church's first transition was occasioned by disaster. When someone entrusted with great responsibility proved himself to be unworthy. And so to this day, we Christians hold fast to our value for openness and for hospitality and welcome, sure, but we also remain vigilant. We stay aware, wise as serpents and innocent as doves, as our Lord Jesus commanded. And just how do we do that? What does that sort of responsible trust and accountable fidelity look like for us in our church communities today? Well, as leaders all across our diocese are being reminded this week, we in the Episcopal Church, we have in place a rigorous program of training for lay and ordained leaders called Safe Church. Now the whole concept of Safe Church is that it helps our leaders protect our children and vulnerable adults from harm. And it does it by raising our awareness about risks of misconduct in our churches. And by showing us best practices, ways to prevent harm from those who are entrusted to our care. We all know very well that even as America has become increasingly secular over the years, Churches are still largely seen as trustworthy and ethical and safe places to be. If a person has a background 
in organized religion at all, why they are likely to give churches some measure of the benefit of the doubt when it comes to trust, when it comes to safety. And that fact, that default sense of trust, that fact we in the church have found has time and again proven not just to be a great asset and strength of ours, but has also been a weakness, a vulnerability. Why? Well, because those whose intentions are to harm or exploit others, especially children, especially vulnerable adults, they are smart. And they know that trusting places like churches are the ideal place to work their wickedness. And so that is why we are so careful here in the Episcopal Church. That is why our safe church requirements are so rigorous and so detailed and so broad. Reaching all those in our parishes who are appointed or elected to positions of trust because we have learned we have learned from our past because we remember. We remember the behavior and the choices of Judas because we have never forgotten just how much pain and harm and suffering can befall us when a person who is undeserving of our trust is placed into a position of power and influence and responsibility and information and access. Even when we did so, we're thinking we were making a wise selection trusting them. Even if we were deceived in our choosing through no fault of our own, even if our best intentions unknowingly proved no match, no match for a wily worker of wickedness. We in the church, we have learned from our ancient as well as our recent past. And so we take so very seriously our work of choosing wisely who we will invite into positions of trust for our present day. And then, then because of our love for God and for ourselves and for one another, then because of our love for the least of these, those who are young, those who are at risk, those who are vulnerable, then we ensure and we require accountability and responsibility and integrity from all of our leaders all the time. And so I bid your prayers for the leaders of our parish and our diocese in the days and the weeks and the months ahead as we are choosing our leaders, making certain that those that we've, ex we've selected are trained and alert and aware and performing their duties in a way that is truly worthy of holding our trust. May we all be up to this task that is now before us. And may our uncompromising fidelity to the truth, the truth made known to us in Jesus Christ our Lord, may that truth help us to sanctify not just ourselves, but all of our world. Amen. We continue together with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. 
On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world, for only in you can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care and guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth your saving health among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and sustain us with your Holy Spirit. O God, the King of glory, you have exalted your only Son, Jesus Christ, with great triumph to your kingdom in heaven. Do not leave us comfortless, but send us your Holy Spirit to strengthen us and exalt us to that place where our Savior Christ has gone before, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, in glory everlasting. Amen. O God, you make us glad with the weekly remembrance of the glorious resurrection of your Son, our Lord. Give us this day such blessing through our worship of you that the week to come may be spent in your favor. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
In peace we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work. For our families, friends, and neighbors. And for those who are alone. For this community, the nation, and the world. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation for the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression, for all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble, for those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy, for the peace and unity of the Church of God, for all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For all bishops and other ministers, for all who serve God in his church, for the special needs and concerns of this congregation, especially for Chris, Roja, Gretchen, Joyce, Susan, Dom, Irene, Dakota, and Ron, and for the intentions on our public prayer wall. Hear us, Lord, for your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life, and especially for the birthdays of Aubrey, Joan, Evie, Alvin, Jason, and Judy. We will exalt you, O God, our King, and praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them, who put their trust in you. Gracious Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Fill it with all truth, in all truth, with all peace. Where it is corrupt, purify it. Where it is an error, direct it. Where in anything it is amiss, reform it. Where it is right, strengthen it. Where it is in want, provide for it. Where it is divided, reunite it. For the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen. We continue together with the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. But above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace, and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies 
that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Alleluia. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to him from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen.